focus continues in Santa Fe, New Mexico, because we can't take our eyes off it. And today it is uh, day three of testimony, kind of, sort of, in this trial. Of course, Alec Baldwin, the well-known actor and producer, um, he has now been charged with involuntary manslaughter in the fatal Rust movie set shooting. Baldwin has pled not guilty to the involuntary manslaughter charges against him. And he claims that he, no, 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 did not pull the trigger that killed Rust cinematographer Helena Hutchins and also injured uh, the director on the set. So we know the armorer, Hannah Gutierrez-Reed, already tried and found guilty of the same charge, involuntary manslaughter. She's been sentenced to the max of 18 months in prison. So attorneys are back in court now. Uh, the jury is not. This relates to a defense motion to dismiss uh, which they brought up just this morning. And it relates to the prosecution's handling of evidence. So we know that uh, they were at sidebar clearing things up. We believe they're bringing in two witnesses, one Corporal Alexandria Hancock, who was involved with the investigation, and also Seth Kenny, who was involved with the firearms. The question becomes, where did these bullets now available to the defense come from? Were they intentionally hidden? Was there a mistake in the investigation? What's going on exactly? So. Are we ready to go back in? Looks like they've got, uh, if it, eh, does, I don't see any, uh, nobody on the stand just yet. Uh, so again, uh, the corporal, Hancock, is going to give us the investigative side of what the heck happened. Uh, but we've been told from the other hearing uh, this morning, uh, from the, earlier in the hearing, that there was some intentional plan to misidentify these bullets under a different case. I mean, that sounds pretty nefarious. Uh, and that's why the court has decided we're going to figure this out. We're going to determine whether it was, in fact, a mistake or whether it was intentional. Hey, uh, joining uh, Catherine Lazardo and I here today, joining the firm is Dave uh, Ehrenberg. Dave, good to have you along. He is a, a Florida state attorney. What do you think of this little uh, side trip we're taking now? The jury's gone home. The court is trying to figure out whether this motion to dismiss by the defense is valid. Where are you on this thing? Well, no matter what the result, the judge is not happy with the prosecutor. And the prosecutor is an experienced criminal defense lawyer who's serving as a special prosecutor. So she knows better. But that, that's the problem going forward. You start to lose the trust of the judge or get the judge's impatience. And it doesn't bode well for you because it is the judge who decides the sentencing in the end and rules of evidence and all these uh, rulings that are going to be really important in the case. But... I will say that I think it's very unlikely that the prosecutor intentionally tried to deceive the court and hide evidence. If that is the case, then this case is gone. I don't think that's going to be the result here. Yeah, and that, that is, of course, the focus of this little part of the hearing. So, Catherine, um, as, we, as we look at the ultimate potential impact here, the jury's not going to know anything about what's going on now. They're not going to know the issue is raised. If it is successful, they'll know that they're going home early. But uh, so when it comes to the laying out of the evidence that's going to get in front of this jury, this is really just like, um, you know, a delay again for this jury. And I never like how that works out. What do you think? Yes, well, jury do doesn't like delays as well because they're they're investing their time here, of course, and you know, and it's such a great honor and service for us. And I think the jury will find out later on if it, what happened after the trial, whether uh, the judge rules to, for the motion to dismiss or against it, they will find out afterwards. Now, the implication of this, um, I wanted to go back to the prosecution prosecution's uh, question to Popel earlier, which is that there is no malice, that there was no uh, cover-up. That was the question she specifically asked. She, the special prosecutor was so quick with her questioning of Popel as to establishing that, because it goes to what Dave is saying, that there is no intention malicious intention of covering up what the ammunition, what happened to this life ammunition. So that's critical for the judge. And I like Judge Summers' approach of being hands-on and outside the box. Let's get this done. Let's figure it out ourselves. <laughs> She's hands-on, all right. She got the gloves and put them put them on her hands. Uh, so Dave, it makes me wonder, I mean, this is trial number two, and the prosecutor who you've just talked about there, Ms. Morrissey, she made it sound like to the court, hey, I, I just got this stuff today. I've never heard a thing about this. So if that's believable, it makes me wonder, well, how did that stay unknown through the course of an entire first trial and, and not raise its ugly head till now? 
Because we're government. Michael. Uh -huh. <laughs> That's an answer that covers most everything. I mean, really, you know, sometimes the easy explanation is just the right explanation that, you know, you have a different prosecutor, a special prosecutor coming here who's not part of the office and doesn't have the same relationship with law enforcement. In fact, as a criminal defense lawyer, this prosecutor, this special prosecutor, usually works against law enforcement. So I can see mix-ups and things happening because, again, we're government. So uh, the question is whether it is malicious. Catherine's right. If it's not intentional, if it's not malicious, then it's not going to lead to the dismissal of this case. And that's what this discussion is about. Yeah. So Catherine, we're not going to hear one of these witnesses say, yep, we did that on purpose. Yeah, we tried to hide that stuff. You caught me. That's not going to happen. So you, you end up with this, uh, you know, I'm going to steal from the Karen Reed case. You get this proctor factor, you know, where one of the internal people in an investigation, you start to look at them kind of side-eyed, uh, and it has an overall taint on the investigation. And I think it takes, to the defense's credit, it takes the jury's eye off the ball, which is what did Baldwin do or not do when handling that gun? Remember, his role as a producer is out the window. So some of these extraneous issues that might have been important, really not relevant now. So hasn't the defense uh, you know, won a small battle already? To some extent, because they have diverted the attention of Judge Summers from the actual trial, even the, the jury, because as we talked about, now it seems it's a trial within a trial for this uh, particular issue that should have been raised as a pretrial motion, uh, you know, a motion in limine. Should we be talking about this and using up our time with the jury because we want an expedited trial. So right now, what I'm thinking is that Troy Teske was the person who turned over this live ammunition that is at issue. Are we going to hear from him as to why he had this before, during uh, Hannah, trials, uh, Hannah Gutierrez Reed's trial? Why did he not bring it out then? And why did it just happen now? Yeah, and, and you know, it's interesting. You mentioned Mr. Teske. He's a friend of Hannah Gutierrez Reed's dad, who is a really a famed armorer, and she was just following in dad's footsteps. Little did she know it was uh, going to be quite as, as painful as it has been. But so uh, let me ask you, Dave, we have this, as, Karen, as Catherine suggests, this critical witness, I would think. He's the one who brought it to the court's attention eventually. Why, it's almost like a sandbagging. You, you, why wouldn't that have come up earlier? Why did this guy all of a sudden, after Hannah Gutierrez Reed uh, is, uh, she's already tried, what, why now, why? I, I don't know. <laughs> I think that's what we're going to find out. I want to hear out. from him. I would like to hear I, from right. him. That's why we want we want to know the answer. Now, the judge is going to get to the bottom of this. He's going to find out if this was just rank incompetence or were they try, was he trying to play games because he is friends with Hannah Gutierrez's father? I, we don't know. But... If he's the one at fault here, you can't then dismiss the case because the prosecutor's at fault. That's not the prosecutor. As long as the prosecutor wasn't in cahoots with him, which I don't think the prosecutor was. And I can tell you as a prosecutor, why would you do this on a grand stage when everyone's watching and you know that you're going to be humiliated and possibly lose your bar license? It's not worth it. The juice is not worth the squeeze. This, to me, was unintentional. Yeah. I, I mean, she looks bad no matter what. I mean, even if she is 100 percent squeaky clean, not uh, at fault. She inherits right. that, that bad feel, that bad look, that bad faith, it appears. So we're going to take a break as they continue to sort things out in that courtroom in New Mexico. Again, the jury is done for the week. Uh, Alec Baldwin seems to be much more animated and into what's happening now because he may sense that this is good for me. Let's take a break. We'll come back after this.